And I wanted to say a couple words about this series before we kick off the program. Um, today is the last event in our uh, 2019 Social Determinants of Health Signature Series, which is part of um, a broader um, effort we are doing this year around the theme of solving for health. We really created this series to highlight progress on persistent health policy issues and talk about tangible ways to move forward. Some of you might have joined us for our summit on social determinants of health back in June, um, and all of the materials from that uh, event are on our website. And we explored a number of themes that we're gonna try to um, narrow in on today. In particular, one of the things that has consistently come up in our conversations around social determinants of health is the um, importance of aligning financial incentives. And um, that's come up over and over again, so we're gonna try to take a little bit of a deeper dive into that issue today. And we have a fantastic panel um, to do that. So one thing that's a little different uh, today about our briefing is it is two hours. Usually we're 90 minutes, but we have a lot to cover. And we have a, um, a special guest, um, Karen DeSalva, today to talk, um, to have kind of a, a keynote um, opening uh, Q&A with us. So we're very excited about that. Um, and then we'll move on to our more traditional uh, panel discussion. And throughout, you'll have plenty of time to ask your questions. So um, before we um, officially kick it off, let me thank our sponsors for the entire Signature Series for making this possible. And I want to point out the importance of having such a broad cross-section of um, the healthcare sector represented, because I think it really shows how important this, um, these questions are of social determinants of health across um, the public and private sectors. So I'd like to thank um, our visionary level sponsor, um, Pharma, our innovator level sponsors, Anthem and Ascension, our champion sponsors, Aetna, Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, Cambia Health Foundation, GlaxoSmithKline, and Kaiser Permanente, as well as our signature sponsor, the Catholic Health Association of the United States. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over very briefly to Courtney Christian, the Director of Policy and Research at Pharma, to give some brief opening welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and it's lovely to see you all here today on this Friday the 13th, the full moon. <laughs> and it's raining, so we're going to make the best of it, right? Uh, my name is Courtney Christian. I'm here from Pharma. Um, we've been happy to be a supporter of the Alliance, as they and many of you here today have really been doing the forward thinking on policy analysis around social determinants of health. Um, doing a lot of the research and opining on economic, budgetary, and infrastructure questions that could really move the needle on these issues. Uh, the answers to these questions pose challenges because there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to policymakers at each level of government um, in seeking to address social determinants of health. Every community is different and every community has its own unique set of needs. This work really requires an educational component of first framing what these determinants are and then meeting communities and patients where they are in a joint effort to improve health outcomes. At Pharma, we're really being intentional and thoughtful about the ways in which our industry can work toward addressing social determinants of health. Uh, we recently convened and launched a health equity roundtable as we undertake this effort and we really look forward to getting input and advice from many of you in this room as we um, move forward. We're really also meeting communities and patients where they are with a mobile health fair program that we have called Roadmap to Health, which brings educational tools, resources, and health screenings free of charge to communities in New York and pretty soon nationally. So we look forward to the continued exchange of ideas here in the effort to bridge the gap on social determinants of health and improved health outcomes the very impressive group of panelists you have here today will surely give us all perspective on how to do so. And lastly, I know um, as a far former Hill staffer, um, if we harness the power of everybody here in this room across all um, areas of government, across all healthcare sectors, we can really do a lot to improve health outcomes for everyone and really uh, make headway um, in, the, in the goal of uh, doing more to address social determinants of health. So thank you and enjoy. Great, thank you. Well, now it's my pleasure uh, to welcome to the stage 
Dr. Karen DeSalvo, the former Acting Assistant Secretary for Health and the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. Um, she is currently a professor in the Departments of Medicine and Population Health at the University of Texas at Austin Dell Medical School and is co-convener of the National Alliance to Impact the Social Determinants of Health, NASDO. She's a nationally recognized health leader and um, I'm gonna go sit down and let her talk. It's gonna be great. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. Morning or good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. This is, as many people know, one of my very favorite topics um, for a lot of years running, and so I'm excited to share some thoughts and um, hear from the panelists, which have been doing really important work to help advance it. Great. Thanks, Karen. So let me let me actually start off by asking you. I mean, you know so much about so many different topics, um, and you've had so much experience across a broad array of health, health care, public health. What inspired you to um, focus your efforts now on social determinants of health and get involved and, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about um, NASDO and what that is. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about my experience with Hurricane Katrina, which was now 14 years ago, as being really instrumental in crystallizing for me as a doctor how important the non-medical determinants were for the health of my patients and the community. It was a, you know, an experience where the healthcare system went down across the board and when we were scrapping together a way to, to provide services for people, you know, literally on the street, stuff that, that was top of their mind um, was about housing and when are the schools gonna open and when are the bus lines gonna be back and do you think my job's gonna come back and all my friends left and I'm lonely and scared and there's nowhere to buy food. I mean, these are all these uh, social determinants, and, and for them it was more important than the diabetes or the hypertension management. And in fact, I, you know, the, as a doctor, it, it, seeing somebody, for example, with diabetes and providing them just the right dose of insulin, you know, at, at just the right time for their care in that environment, um, and then realizing that they actually didn't have a house or they didn't have electricity in their house, it was kind of for naught, right? Because giving them the right medical care wasn't gonna take, was only gonna take them so far. And so that was really, um, I think, uh, an important time for me to realize that when, when we built back our community, it had to be inclusive, not just of great medical care, but of a, a social, social care system and integration that would support the people and community that we serve. But it's. It, you know, as, as I've reflected on this more and more over time, I think of so many experiences that I had across my life, uh, particularly many of them in the exam room or at the bedside, where when I listened carefully, what they were telling me was that it wasn't that they didn't understand what to eat or what they should be doing for their care, or that sometimes even uh, if we could get them the right care, it was there were so many other things happening um, uh, to them in their lives and that were barriers to their health and, and well-being. And you know, so when I was at HHS, I used that opportunity to <clears throat> start to lift up a national conversation about the importance of social determinants of health, particularly in the context of how multi-sectoral collaboration needed to be part of the solution. This isn't just for medicine, it's not just for public health, it's not just for social care, it's not just for community, it's about uh, everyone coming together. It was certainly my experience in New Orleans of the way that we approached this, and especially when I was health commissioner. So Public Health 3.0, which is a report that we put out that talks about social determinants and, and what all the various actors in the ecosystem, the system can do to support uh, people in communities and frankly what people in communities can do to, to empower themselves was um, a, a focus of my work towards the end of the term and I left quite frankly feeling so unsatisfied because there was so much more I wanted to do around social determinants not only at the practice level but at the policy level and so Mike Levitt um, who is former HHS secretary um, and someone I've known since the time of Katrina when he was helping us to rebuild our system asked what I was interested in working on and I said I want to create a pragmatic approach to, to this nation understanding and finding a way to support social determinants, not just downstream, but also upstream, and um, do that in a way that's nonpartisan and that um, really supports all the great work that happens on communities on the front line, he said, I'm in. And um, he, he has lots of his own reasons for appreciating the sort of why and why now, much of which re reflects his time as governor, actually, 
And so NASDO was born out of that shared interest um, to really think through a new paradigm for what health is in this country, not just about health care, but also about the broader uh, drivers of health. And, and we have pulled together a coalition of the willing, can I say that on the Hill? Um, and uh, uh, folks who we knew were in the space or near to the space, and this is now a couple of years ago. So we have this nice mix of consumers and public health and social care and health plans and health care systems and technology and business who have come to the table to think through uh, a new pathway forward so that we can really you know, drive health to the country. Great, thanks. So you, you, um, you've, you've laid out some principles for kind of the pathway forward. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, you've talked about shifting that paradigm or shifting that frame. Um, and, and obviously this is something that folks have been talking about for a long time now. I think I remember um, talking about social determinants of health in public health school, which was, I won't admit how long ago, but so the why, why now, and like what now? Mm. Yeah, this was an interesting dynamic uh, a couple of years ago when social determinants of health um, uh, light bulb went off in the healthcare system, and especially in the C-suites and the boardrooms. And I, I've spent a lot of time uh, evangelizing around the country about social determinants in the last couple of years, but so have many uh, other folks. And I think the, um, uh, for those of us who have been working on social determinants, particularly through a public health lens or through the social care system lens, uh, it, it's for initially was, wait a minute, yeah, you, why are y'all now at the party? Because this has been something we've been, been working on. But I think where the countries evolve pretty quickly is that the solution set is gonna take more than the resources at hand or the approach that we've been trying uh, historically. And that's, for example, one of the reasons that we're so excited to have interest from the business sector or from technology as they're thinking through um, new design approaches and, and, and new solutions. So our um, uh, broad view on this is that there are places for common ground and there is work to be done that relates to sh not only shaping public and private sector policy, but um, supporting data and technology and information flow, um, also creating a, a, a harmonized and, and um, rational system for assessing impact so that we can build upon what we learn and and really spread and scale as quickly as possible, but do all of that, um, not for but with people and community, and uh, be certain that whatever is being built is um, really resonates with the cultural and other expectations on the ground. This is not like straightforward stuff, but, but you being a public health person know what I've just described is public health. And it's the way that we go about, go about doing our business. I think the why now though, why others got involved um, and interested is to do with the value-based care approach. Um, and this is, I think, philosophically incredibly important for us to understand, but in, in short, you know, when you begin to tell the big actor in driving health in this country, the healthcare system, that now it's not just about doing things and getting paid, but you're gonna be accountable for total health and, health and total cost. And when you have accountable entities like Medicare Advantage plans or uh, Medicaid managed care plans or systems like integrated delivery systems, as they get further on the journey to value and understand that, that they have some downside risk if they can't reduce unnecessary use of the healthcare system, they start to peel back the layers to figure out why is grandma coming back to the ER all the time? Now, most clinicians could tell you why grandma's coming back to the ER all the time. She's lonely, she's hungry, she's buying food for her pet dog that's her only companion versus buying her medication. These are common clinical stories that we all see. But I think as we're, now we have big data that can tell us this pattern, not just for one person, but for populations. And we've learned that uh, on the value journey, we've learned that people who are medically complicated are also socially complicated. And so the solution set to being successful in value-based care has to be about more than clinical excellence. It has to also find a way to weave together social care for that person, for populations, and, and then more broadly. And so, like many things um, in this nation, uh, the driver has to do with the bottom line. I think people, the health systems are realizing that there's, there's more that they want to do. And I don't mean to say that uh, in a pejorative way. Because I do think that there, and I know that there are a lot of health system uh, actors in this who are very motivated and driven by uh, a mission to improve health of people and communities. So 
and that is really good, but it's not as sustainable as a solid business model where it's part of what the CFO believes. And that's the place where uh, when, when we can feel like the CFO believes this is part of the core set of metrics, the core set of things that they're following for whatever organization, that's when I think we've hit the sweet spot. I, would, I often say the actuaries, but um, may maybe that's a, the sort of the, the, the more proximate one. And once the actuaries believe it, then maybe the, the, the fi chief financial officers will believe it also. So that's why I think it's the why now. I, I mentioned briefly the data, by the way, and I, I don't want to pass over that too quickly because I think, you know, if you, if you consider where we were even a decade ago, we didn't have capabilities not only um, of analyzing data in, in the way that we do today, but of mapping it, of looking at it, of presenting it in such a way that you can have hotspot maps, that you can show data on U.S. suicide rates by zip code and get a feeling for where there's density of challenges or where the opioid challenges are and map that against others, other issues around like social risk. So we're, we it, visually, I think, if you can put that on the front page of the Washington Post, it captures the imagination more than some tables and charts. And I, I think that the analytics behind it, and plus the way that we're able to better present data, is helping the conversation to really move along. Great, thank you. So I, I wanna get to, to some of those specifics. I mean, this is such a big, broad problem, or it can seem that way. So as you start to work with all of these different entities um, in the healthcare system, like how do you start to think about, are there specific roles um, are there specific places to start? I mean, do you start with the data? Do you start with um, the community? You know, you talked about kind of not for community, but with, um, you know, I mean, how do you begin to like define the problem in a, in a way that's really tangible that you can start to act on? I mean, I'll be honest, I haven't completely figured it out, but I'll tell you the things that I've tried. And, um, you know, the, the, the first thing that I would say to this group is that the social determinants of health is big. Uh, it is life and how we live it. And it is not for healthcare to solve alone or for policymakers. It's not a purely public sector challenge. It's our, our society's challenge. And, and so my, my call to action here is not about specific legislation or a specific way that we interpret a rule. This is a, um, a failure of our appreciation as a country of what drives health and that we can't just keep focusing on the 20%. We have to think about the 60% that drives health outcomes for people and communities. It's about where they live and learn and work and play, uh, the conditions in their communities. It could be air quality, it could be access to sidewalks, but it's also uh, the, 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 the drivers that cause us to behave a certain way in a community. How do we make those choices in the moment about whether we're gonna take the stairs or the escalator? How do we find the kind of social connectivity that supports us when we're feeling down or lonely? How do we have the kind of economic opportunity that's really a job ladder? So this is, um, uh, again, back to sort of not just being a healthcare sector challenge, though healthcare has an incredibly important role to play for all kinds of obvious reasons. Um, we're, we're the, we're the, where what every, when people think of health, they think of a stethoscope, you know, and so they go right to medicine, um, and, and it's great that medicine is in, interested and engaged, uh, but they're gonna need partners to get this right for a bunch of reasons, and, and you mentioned it about community. I think this is where um, we're, we're still having a lot of tension. So, so let's say medicine wants to figure out what it can do. Data is usually where I recommend they start. Uh, pull your data, figure out who are the highest risk individuals that you have in your population and learn about them. There are structured questionnaires, there are ways that you can sit at the bedside in the hospital environment or in the, in the dialysis unit or in the um, post-acute care environment and say, so we need to understand uh, some things about your life, not just about your health. And then um, use what's, what's already available, sometimes publicly available, like the Aunt Bertha tool to find resources nearby. Now, if you can step up the sophistication of how you uh, identify high-risk populations and people and how you connect them with services and how you manage the care plan and the data, there are some very sophisticated approaches um, for companies that have been doing this a lot longer, like Kaiser Permanente. Uh, on the other hand, uh, even small federally qualified health centers in rural Arkansas that I have visited are, are making good inroads because they're learning that food insecurity is the biggest driver for social need in their population and, and they learn from the community this is about the with, but it wasn't just about referring people to a food bank, that was an, uh, an insult to their dignity, the patients were telling them. They didn't wanna go and they didn't have transportation so they, they made a food distribution center in the clinic 
so that now when people go to get health care, they're just going to health care, but they can leave with groceries. Modeled a little bit on like what a big system like Geisinger did, building a food pharmacy, but nuanced in a way that works for that community. So uh, what, what are, where I'm going with this is it's a really big problem, but like any big problem, I, you, you know, you say you got to eat that elephant one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, what, that's what I'm finding in every time zone, every temperate zone across this country is a lot of innovation. But that innovation is typically driven by an inspired leader in the right place at the right time who gets their hands on some good data. What we need to do is figure out how those are not one-off projects uh, driven by char charisma, but actually become part of the mainstream of the way that we're holding systems accountable, and I use that term broadly, for the health of people. And we're, you know, and, and again, we're making some strong inroads to, to, to systematize that, but we have a long way to go uh, for, for this to be a bunch of projects to being something that's more of a, of a national strategy in a way that we're thinking about building uh, the sequentially upon the, the learnings of others and then weaving this into, again, the, the, the mainstream. Well, thanks. I want to give time to the audience for um, a question or two. Um, so if you have a question, um, there's mics um, there. Just you know, raise your hand and someone will come around with a, with a hand mic. We have time for maybe one or two questions. And while you're thinking about your questions, let me, let me kind of ask you, Karen, I mean, there's so much excitement about this issue right mm. now. I mean, are there any fault lines or unintended consequences that folks should be watching out for as, as um, you know, people who want to um, really make progress yeah, uh, you know, moving forward? I'm, I'm so, you know, crazy excited and optimistic about how, how the country's said health is more than health care. And uh, on the other hand, I'm so concerned and uh, worried <laughs> that the country has woken up and said health is more than health care because there's a lot of hype. And um, I think what, what you, you see is... Um, good, good intentions of presenting um, uh, an effort that was done without a lot of scientific rigor, so it's really difficult to understand the, uh, if that can be spread or scaled. I, I, you're going to hear some good data today, which I think is the kind of thing that we really need um, to, to be weighing into. And in the, um, you know, the National Academy of Medicine has a report coming out next week, the, no, the 25th, uh, which is about integrating social care into healthcare, and I hope you all will join us. And that's my commercial, um, to, to hear a set of recommendations that point to the public and private sector about what could be done in a strategic fashion to advance um, the downstream impacts around the social determinants of health and try to get the, the filter through some of the hype. I, I might just raise a couple of big points about um, worries, and one is that we're going to medicalize the social determinants of health and turn this into part of a benefits package or a new thing that uh, doctors have to click in the electronic health record um, or uh, you know, some other manifestation. And in reality, this is, um, though healthcare has an important role to play and they get, should have some shared accountability, we, ought, we should be thinking about how to strengthen the public health and social care sectors so that they can be partners to healthcare and not just expect healthcare, Medicaid, Medicare, whatever, to, to, to take over it all. And I think the other one I would just mention since sometimes in healthcare we're not as in tune to it, is that we might harm the people we want most to help. And that, that could manifest as, um, um, so for example, asking a grandmother if she has electricity and her revealing that she doesn't, and then um, having to call Child Protective Services because she's been taking care of grandkids in the home. And really what you were trying to do is help her get electricity, but then you've kind of run into a situation where now she's um, in, in, have to, having to worry about keeping her grandkids. There are other problems about exacerbating disparities, and, and I'm hearing stories about this already on the ground, that the social care organizations, because they feel overwhelmed, are learning to cherry pick in just the way the healthcare system learned and try to take the healthier people who have social needs and because they don't have the resources uh, to help folks. And, and then that just further marginalizes those who have more needs. So there are some, this is, this is part of my hope that we develop a national strategy around, around social determinants because we could be off on a pathway that either won't show benefit because we haven't done the science right and we haven't shared information or we've harmed people without realizing it because we haven't been transparent or we've uh, gone way too far to make this something medical and not really thought about how it's a shared responsibility. Thank you so much. All right, any, if there's no question, there's a question back there. Yes, just um, someone come around with the mic. Thank you. 
so much. Uh, um, I'm Henry Pratt. I'm a healthcare IT consultant. I work with Medicaid plans a lot. Quick question. I think you just touched on this topic, but any in your travels, have you witnessed any best practices in terms of how, for example, a health plan comes to know about the SDOH needs of a, of a person? Um, for example, in some states, the states will try to have the SDOHCs file a prepare form or something like that. It kind of interrupts in their flow. But have you seen any other ways that one might come uh, to know about uh, situations like that? Okay, I have 12 seconds. Um, we can go a couple This <laughs> is, um, <laughs> thank you for the question, because the knowing uh, is, is uh, I think, one of the da unintended consequences. We're, we're on the precipice of, of ha asking people to prove to us over and over again that they're hungry or have housing challenges. Um, and because they're as we're asking them to fill out a lot of long questionnaires. And we, we need to avoid that at all costs as a country and get to the business of helping people. And so the solution set for this, um, just it, it, actually there's a, a stream of work going on through an effort called Gravity, which um, is now a formal project supported um, by the standards body HL7. And everyone's on board, hundreds of organizations, to create a more transparent, interoperable, way to define social uh, social profile, but there's some important work that we want to do at NASDA, which is about leveraging modern open standards to, and when I say standards, I mean technology standards, for those of you who are not tech folks, to use APIs to better connect not only care plan data, but administrative data. And uh, I'm not sure I've seen a best practice quite yet, but I, here's what I would say is that an, a really op, uh, optimistic view is that all the digital platforms, tools that are being developed in social determinants are using open standards. They're, they're approaching this challenge as one of, they want an interoperable system, which is a far cry from how we did this in healthcare. So I'm very optimistic that this is gonna serve people better uh, in the future, but um, love to talk to you afterwards specifically about some stuff we're doing because um, we're, we're working on building a best practice model. Thank you. I think we have is there one more question or? Yeah, one more question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you. I'm Leslie Ritter. I'm with the National MS Society. You mentioned a lot around needing the data to do this, and we know that a public health infrastructure is not what we need it to be in terms of data collection and surveillance data that we would need. Um, so for those of us in the room, what advice would you give us to kind of help build support for that kind of infrastructure? God bless you. Um, thank you for the question, and we, we, we didn't have time to talk about things that the Hill could do, and maybe this is my chance to quickly uh, say that. I think one important um, lesson for, for folks on the Hill, uh, one thing is start where you are, which is learning, um, and learn in your own, your, your members' districts, because they, there's uh, going to be work happening, and if we can be helpful, I'm more than happy to do that. Know that there's a lot of uh, existing statutory authority already for Medicaid and Medicare Advantage, in particular the latter, thanks to what Congress did um, even just recently. And the administration and states are working to within that, that regulatory authority to, to sort out how to not only do their own work, uh, but also how to build partnerships uh, in the community. Which gets to your question. The partner, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And um, my work in public health 3.0 was to call out that public health was not strong enough to be a partner uh, in all kinds of ways, including its opportunity around workforce data infrastructure. And we, do, we did do some work on that, which uh, shows that we're short about $12 a person a year in this country to fund the public health infrastructure to, to be able to provide the services that everyone should expect in the country. Uh, happy to, to send some more information about that. We did it in partnership um, with uh, many others and, and just published a paper in the American Journal of Public Health on it this month. Uh, the other sector which um, I would like us to pay an awful lot of more attention to is the social care sector. They um, uh, are really struggling on the front lines to meet not only the current expectations, but this rush of people that are about to come at them. Many of those organizations are working off of um, paper or IT systems that can't meet cybersecurity expectations to be a part of this broader interoperability world and their workforce isn't quite ready for it and their um, uh, business model isn't quite there. There's good efforts to try to advance that, but this is gonna take something on the scale of what we did to transform healthcare. The billions of dollars that we spent to get healthcare ready for value is the kind of thing we're gonna think about needing to do for their partners to get them ready for value. Thank you. 
Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. I, um, Karen DeSalva, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know we could we could go on and and on probably and and have and and talk uh, much more about this. You pointed some great resources, which we will make sure um, are also on the Alliance website as well. And um, we'll now have time for um, our next panel. Thank great. you. Thank so you guys much. so much. <laughs> I'm now going to ask our panelists to come um, and join us um, up on the stage, please. All right. And uh, I'm just going to um, wait just one moment till everyone is seated and then go ahead and start introducing them. Um, by the way, um, while, while we're um, taking a moment to transition, and again, just as a reminder, we will go to... Um, two o'clock um, today for the briefing. So um, if you think of questions to ask, you have some green pieces of paper at your um, table. So be thinking about your questions. We'll be um, collecting those during the Q&A session. Um, and we also have a blue evaluation form in your packet. And we hope you'll take a minute to fill that out as well before you, before you leave. Um, so that was a great conversation with um, Karen DeSalvo. And um, I uh, would now like to introduce um, our panel who is working on uh, a number of, excuse me, uh-oh, look, look for your chairs. <laughs> it's not true. You do need them. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. I didn't take ballet lessons for nothing. We're going to improvise here. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let me... Uh, let me now introduce our panel. Um, so I'm gonna, um, we're gonna go in the order of the of the uh, the panel discussion. So um, you have longer bios in your in your pan in your uh, folders as well. Um, so first, um, I'm really pleased to introduce um, Bill York. Uh, Bill is the executive vice president of 211 San Diego, one of the most two, uh, successful 211 providers in the nation, and he has dedicated his focus and leadership to developing strong teams to manage the many operational hubs of 211 San Diego, as well as the region's community information exchange. Um, and his stewardship has really gained national recognition, so we're excited to hear what's going on on the ground in San Diego, and thanks for coming all the way across the country to uh, be with us today. Um, we will then hear from Dr. Samuel Ross, who is Chief Community Health Officer for Bon Secours Mercy Health and the President of Bon Secours Baltimore Health System. Along with managing an acute care hospital in the heart of West Baltimore, Dr. Ross is also responsible for a vast network of community outreach divisions that focus on positively impacting outcomes that influence the social determinants of health, including affordable housing, education, job skills, behavioral health, substance abuse, and rehabilitation. Uh, we're next delighted to hear from uh, Anna Navais, the Deputy Director of the Rhode Island Department of Health. She's worked in public health for more than 30 years, including um, in countries other than the United States, in um, Africa, Portugal, and, um, and beyond. Um, she's worked with the Rhode Island Department of Health since 1998, focusing on achieving health equity throughout areas of health disparities and access to care, and chronic disease management and prevention, environmental health, and maternal and child health. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and then um, on the other side here to my left, we have um, the Chief Executive Officer of KB Stack Consulting. A one-woman operation, awesome. Kathy Stack, like Wonder Woman. She has a distinguished career in the federal government, including 27 years at the White House Office of Management and Budget, where she served under five presidents, focusing on improving the design and implementation of innovative, evidence-focused initiatives that require coordination across agencies and levels of government, um, and played a central role in the development of some things that um, Kathy's going to talk about today, including pay for success and performance partnership pilots for disconnected youth. So excited to hear more about that. Uh, and then last but not least, um, we're delighted to have um, joining us today Len Nichols, director of the Center for Health Policy Research and Ethics at George Mason University, having served as a senior advisor for health policy at the Office of Management and Budget in the Clinton administration, uh, to being an innovation advisor to um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation at CMS, he has been deeply involved in health reform debates, policy development, and communication um, with the media and policymakers for um, a number of years. We're delighted to have you, Len. So um, we're going to now turn it over um, to Bill York to kick it off and uh, tell us what's going on on the ground in San Diego. Thanks. Great. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me here. We're, we're honored for uh, 2-1 San Diego and CIE to actually uh, come. So I have to thank the Alliance for inviting us. 
Um, oftentimes, our regional approaches don't get picked up to the national conversation. We have had, because of some of our awareness through Robert Wood Johnson, uh, data across sectors and our work with Sirens. So I appreciate that we're able to come and talk a little bit about what's happening for sort of our boots on the ground look at things and from our 211 CIA perspective. Um, to give you a little background of uh, San Diego, and a, a lot of times we are in different rooms where people don't understand what 211 system is. We're, we're always amazed that people don't, are, are not aware that's 248 211s across the country, 50% of those run by United Way, um, and 50% stand alone. But if you've seen one 211, you've seen one 211 in how they might um, operate. And it's really according to the way that the community might embrace them and support them. We've been lucky enough in San Diego that with the county of San Diego, we were once part of United Way and left in the early 2000s, became our own 211, and quickly realized that the model of information referral was not working. Um, we were also thought about as heretics in the 211 world for a long time, of saying that we needed to have a more client record versus a call record system, that we needed to track outcomes, we needed to know whether services were actually being delivered. And it's taken us over 10 years to get to that point. On top of that, our local San Diego County has had a 10-year plan called the Live Well Initiative that actually was to build a better service delivery system. And the three components of that were building better health, living safety, and thriving. And so many of our nonprofits worked that into the system that they were working, as well as other community organizations came together and said, our systems around social services is, are broken. Um, we have 3.3 million people in San Diego County. We're one of the largest, you know, as large as 19 states. We, uh, and we realized people were bouncing around programs and services that we didn't know, making seven to 10 calls before they found services. So 211 started its transition to a, its own personal record many years ago, and then our community started on a community information exchange, which to us is a very defined, um, has to find components to that. So it's a systems change that foster true collaboration um, across networks. And uh, it's really moving to a person-centered uh, interactions and from healthcare and to human services. And it goes from improving health and wellness um, for individuals and for populations. So right now, from 211's perspective, we have over 70 partners in our community information exchange that share data across systems. Um, they're able to share um, their outcome data, their referral data, and so we are actively, and we're also actively working with communities across the country, so a lot of pieces I'm going to share with you today are not just our learnings, but from eight to ten other communities that we're learning, and so my last few slides are really around the funding barriers and some of the partnership things that we're seeing that really needs to move forward. So because of the many silos that are really happening in social services organizations, and I'll, I'll talk about that for a moment. So on the community information exchange, and this is a really important piece because we're seeing community information exchange come up in many different ways, and we have a very, you know, capital CIE information exchange versus creating a community information exchange. It is no longer just a technology or a network of providers. It really is an ecosystem, and it's a multidisciplinary multi network of providers with a shared language with a resource database, an integrated technology platform, and really the community care planning. So um, we have learned a lot in the last five years since we have launched this new system. Um, it has evolved from, again, being just a technology of providers and shifted to really a systems change. So 211 San Diego has had the opportunity to be put at that backbone role, um, but it is a community partnership of over 70 organizations that really, again, from bridging health, social services, um, and really, it's really moving away from being you know, reactive to proactive into a person-centered model. So right now we have over 75 cross-sector partnerships um, that actually agree to the same business association agreements, to partnership agreements, clients' consents, authorizations, screenings, which would prefer deeper assessments, specifically around food, transportation, uh, and housing, versus a few questions. And it really does incorporate the 211 database, which I will tell you I think is valuable at different levels across the country as a national resources that 211 does have a science of knowing where program services um, exist and actually the eligibility to get there, all at different levels, but I think are valuable to the national conversation. 
So the functionality allows us and all our network uh, partners to actually directly see information, sort of a, uh, I, we like to call it a golden record across social services that now integrates other data systems. That's what's different between what's happening and people calling that they have a community information exchange versus a data exchange, bi-directional referral care coordination. Um, some of our sectors that we actually have in our CIE, and again, it, we've been working on this a long time. Um, it, it was a, a lot more work than we expected, um, a lot more cost than we expected, but we have housing providers. We have our multi-service agencies that are often offering hundreds of programs, from, and many that include transportation, housing, food banks. Um, our multi-service aging, legal, employment agencies, and of course, nutrition. Our San Diego Food Bank alone in their system represents 442 um, pantries, anything from church, uh, you know, from faith-based to actually a larger pantry at healthcare organizations that are also integrated into our system. In the healthcare uh, section, uh, we have health plans, um, Blue Shield, um, Care First, again, Molina. We have hospitals that are now sharing data from, uh, directly from the EHR. Emergency medical services allowing us to see uh, 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 transport data um, to uh, the emergency rooms, healthcare centers, federal um, FQHCs. Uh, we're very proud of our San Diego Health Income Exchange. It's, a, it's a, an award-winning that integrates a health and exchange from seven different healthcare systems. Yes, we have seven different health plan systems and seven managed Medicaid plans in San Diego. Um, and then we have behavioral health data as well as public health. Um, that are all integrated into our CIE. In our government sector, we're proud of San Diego as they all, we went on a journey, they also took a system and built what they call ConnectWell, integrating several of their disparate system from their foster care to uh, probation, to their eligibility um, benefit system, to child welfare services and connected a large system, ConnectWell, that also connects to our CIE, again, with data use agreements of what should be able to be seen, who can see that, role-based permissions for, again, to do care coordination across a population. One of the things that is uh, um, something that we're proud of that we built at, um, as a component of CIE is the ability to um, measure and track the change over time. Before 211 and CIE actually had a longitudinal record we saw that clients were sitting in systems and as they entered or left programs, there was no long-term tracking of their progress and exactly what happened to them before and after. And I give, the, uh, I give the example of HMIS systems, fantastic HMIS systems out there, when you enter homelessness and when you leave it. So what is the pre-indicators that's happening? And already we're seeing a lot of data that shows us what steps it's taking for a person and how many calls and how many access to other agencies does it actually take for them to enter homelessness. A recent report we put out on Thursday in the housing stability is that one out of the four of our callers within four months of us, the, them calling us for a housing or a utility need are entering homelessness. So being able to move upstream. That's not just with the 211 data, that's with HMIS data, that's with other data from those other multi-service agencies. And so we're actually in our CIE and because of that risk rating scale, being able to see what happens over time, use that data, other agencies and care coordination, and seeing the other care plans are able to in do interventions. We've seen reductions in return to homelessness. We've seen reductions in emergency room visits. I mentioned the resource database and the bi-directional referrals. I think this is very important to highlight is that the 211, although they are at different places and scopes out there and sizes, they are a valuable resource. There's 60 years of expertise around the Alliance Information Referral Systems. Not all the same, but do understand agency programs, services, and where they're rendered, and understand eligibility requirements. So we think they're part of the conversation that people should be having. Can they do what we've done? Not all. Some are moving into those conversations. Most of those other eight communities to 12 that we're working with are not 211s. So it is a great repository that is actually well known for its process, and I do want to say I'm a 211 fan as a way in. We take over 500 unique calls a year. We have 250,000 unique records um, of clients in our system, and we have over 125 that share their data through the CIE system, so um, uh, to across those 75 agencies. I love this slide just so I can just wow you with our technology. Um, it, it's just, and why I really wanted to share this is that 
we feel that it's very important to not talk about an off-the-shelf referral product. And I think in the conversation we're having, linking healthcare to get them a referral for food, transportation, or housing, when each community is complicated, it's different, resources are different, housing, uh, housing um, uh, inventories are low, shelters are low, and so we believe a list is just a list. And so just a simple referral directory versus, versus data interaction is very important. We have deployed an enterprise-wide solution with Salesforce. We've laid it over an inter, um, uh, Informatica system that it can adjust anything from CSV to X, uh, Excel, APIs. Again, I think Karen mentioned that the nonprofit systems are all at different places in their technology. Steve and, Ball, Steve and Connie Ballmer just last year invested $59 million in a nonprofit saying that, 20, that, that most social services and data outcomes are 20 years behind. And we are seeing that in San Diego throughout the county, uh, country in the technology they have in order to share this data and measure outcomes. And then we integrate from all kinds of different data systems. I mentioned already that we've integrated our HUD-funded HMIS systems. We have our HSS repository, Connect Well, our Health Information Exchange, and we've connected, um, we've connected with um, our three FQHCs, our food bank system, which re represents those 442 pantries, our local workforce partnership, which is our uh, employment, and then uh, several of the local EMS and ambulance transport, so we can get the, we can actually get when someone's transported to um, an emergency room. We also, which is an interesting hurdle as well as something's valuable, are able to get who's in jail data. It's sad that we can't get who's getting out of jail data, so we could actually have a real reentry program. So some of the things that will uh, is a barrier. We like to look at our system as you know um, the micro uh, meso. I don't know how long I'm, I'm going over time. Is that that already till seven minutes? A minute or so. All right. <laughs> I'm going to jump to I'm jumping to a couple of slides because this is really what I want to get to. And it was really notes from the field in four parts of where we were talking about barriers to access. Uh, you know, current funding really does hinder the um, the hinder innovation for systems change. Change is slow, and the state of the field is uh, tells us time is now, and interoperability is key. And let me tell you about a few of those things. The funding structures, particularly for social service providers. Do not foster growth. They do not, got, they do not foster technology. They do not foster in, uh, innovation. They're, it is so uh, competitive. It's a patchwork of social services out there that are chasing competitive funding and reimbursement contracts. And they're still expected to be providing the safety net. And I think that's the conversation between healthcare is are there actually resources available to refer to in an overwhelmed system already? And what does that look like? We've heard from many places, why would we pay for a referral to a program that exists that's in, in from different, um, uh, from different uh, uh, parts of healthcare, government, as well as even business? There are dozens of silos across multiple um, systems. Some of that has to do with where the funding comes from. Transportation wants a transportation data network. Food wants a food network. Behavioral health wants a food, a, 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 a behavioral health network. So it's difficult to secure, uh, to connect all of those systems. And then we actually have found that the backbone support funding is not there as supportive. So our own philanthropy and our own funding and sustainability comes into question each year. And actually the components of research, of research is actually not supported as well. We get several grants that actually they think it's a great idea and they cut out the research, the research component completely. We know the ch change takes over time, meaningful partnerships, not just collaboration is what's important. One of the biggest lessons I'm going to learn that I'm going to jump to is that technology is the easy part, but the people and the partners are the glue. Uh, after the initial build, it's our staff that's the most in, uh, the, the most costly. I think Karen mentioned is actually working with integrating into the way that services are built in the community. If you're working with social service providers, they have ways that they've worked that are required to work with them. We have now have to embed ourselves into those agencies and look at their workflow in order to be successful to work in CIE. So we know that change takes time. Interoperability, I heard it already, I think, twice today. 
that, that the lack of data standards around social services, and I think you were referring to meaningful use and the things that happened with HIEs and electronic health records, if there was something that could standardize around social services. We are underrepresented and often um, underrepresented or misunderstood or even, um, um, I, I think, minimized in, in the value system, but everybody wants to connect to that wellness. So I think those are some of the challenges. And, and again, there is no voice. I saw there was many associations and American associations of different things in the room, and there isn't, an, uh, there isn't a national association that's representing a wide breadth of uh, social service programs here. And we go to many rooms where we have to represent our community for those programs. So in closing, and again, I apologize to go over, um, I wish we had an instructional manual for how to do this. I, you know, as an operations guy at heart, I would have loved to just implemented something and said, give me the book and I'll follow it. So we've been partially writing it and sharing it, but also bringing, you know, keeping ourselves out of the bubble, bringing best practices in. And in the last few years, it's been a, quite a whirlwind of what we've done. We see that we've actually hit, um, we've hit a great stride, that um, we have more partners joining, healthcare is joining, healthcare is starting to pay for it. They see the values, we're seeing the outcomes. So, but I will tell you, it came at a cost with new privacy and security officers, new attorneys, the new chief medical officer, with all those things that we didn't really expect when we thought we were building an integrated technology to share, share data. So, um, we even selfishly created our own Community Information Exchange Summit where we bring 500 leaders in this to discuss in the spring about what this looks like and where this is going. So I skipped over a few things, interoperability. I don't want to go over time, but um, so hopefully this was, you know, again, try to put my context in there with what we're doing. But again, thank you for allowing me to come and talk. Thanks so much, Bill. And I think we'll, um, we'll get into some really interesting Q&A. And um, thanks for sharing that um, very on-the-ground example of... Um, you know, just how challenging it is in, in, one, in one town. Um, so, um, Dr. Ross, could you share an example from another town across the country? Um, sure. Fonsequa Mercy Health in Baltimore, thanks. Am I on? Okay, so thank you. Uh, you worried about time, don't worry about time. I'm also the son of a Baptist minister, so. <laughs> <laughs> how much time do y'all have? <laughs> It's, it's all good. So <laughs> one of the things I would say, you know, hearing what's been said and what Karen said earlier as well, you know, everybody's here from a different perspective. And so I tell our team a lot of times, unlike the Western movies, the cavalry ain't coming. Well, maybe, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> maybe the cavalry is coming. <laughs> the, other, the other thing I tell them is that, you know, we are the ones we have been waiting for. Because, you know, this is the choir. And when we come to these meetings, we preach to one another and we have a pep rally and we leave feeling good. But there are a lot of other people outside of these walls that we need to be converting uh, to the mission. And then the, the third thing I'll say before I get into my slides, and I'll, I'll, I'll Stay on time. I won't, I won't do the preacher thing. Being the son of a Baptist preacher, I'm going to make three points. Then I'm going to pass the collection plate. <laughs> so the first point, again, because we all come from diverse areas, and this came, actually came from a minister's sermon years ago, was to start where you are. Because we're all in different places with our organizations, our resources. So start where you are. The second point is, in doing that, use what you have. Because again, we all have different resources available to us. And then the third point is to do what you can with those resources that you have at, you know, at available to you. So Bonsecour Mercy Health, we merged a year ago. Bonsecour, which was based uh, on the East Coast, and Mercy, which was Ohio. So we became but most of us were like three and a half billion dollar organizations and we're now, you know, eight, eight plus billion dollar organization. And we just added Bontecourt, Ireland. So we've crossed the pond and uh, have gone international. But our mission is our why. I think Karen mentioned uh, something earlier about why everybody does this organizationally, but being Catholic healthcare, 
and the sisters who came to this country over 100 years ago, they came to provide service and to care for those you know, who had needs. So that's, that's been our why throughout this process. Some of, the, some of the challenges we have is terminology. We tend to use community health, population health, public health, kind of all interchangeably. And quite honestly, the community doesn't care because that's not how they refer to themselves. And so we, we may feel good about it, it may help us understand, it may help to educate us, but as we go out among the community, let's, let's just be aware that they don't know what we're saying when we say these three different things. And sometimes we don't know what we're saying when we say these three different things. But our focus has really been, and my, my new job over the last year has been community health for our system across seven states. And it really is about focusing our efforts in a different way. Now there is an intersection with pop health because population health primarily has been around value-based purchasing. But that's only a subset of a community because not all the people in the community are members of Medicare Advantage or some commercial plan that has these benefits. So we just need to understand you know, what we're dealing with. The other thing we talk about social determinants of health. How many of y'all have been to a community meeting where someone who's grassroots in the community stood up and said, I want to talk about social determinants of health? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> we, that's our terminology, and we feel good about it, and we hang on to it. Uh, s there's literature now that says it's not social determinants, it's social influencers of health, because you say determinant. That means that if I'm born in that community, I have no choice but to end up a certain way. But we know that these factors, housing, education, uh, transportation, et cetera, influence our outcomes because <coughs> not everybody you, know, you grew up with, regardless of the resources that existed in your community, you know, ended up the same way. The other thing I want to say briefly is community benefit versus community investments. And this gets to the funding issue, and particularly in healthcare. Community benefits is defined by the Affordable Care Act and how we maintain our, our not-for-profit status. And so the long list that you see there is really what's required for us to report and how we track that number. The, s the smaller number, which is where we all have to do a better job in partnership, is on the investment side. What are the, the, the dollars, discretionary dollars, that exist in our organizations that we can invest in social determinants? So most large systems have you know, community direct investment funds, they have foundation budgets, um, and they have operating budgets. So those in your communities, just think about your health systems and, and those opportunities that, are, that they have. The driver for what we decide to invest in should be our community health needs assessments. And again, mandated through the Affordable Care Act and what we need to do every three years. So the priorities that exist where we decide what's important in a community, is it housing, is it behavioral health, is it transportation, should come from the community um, health needs assessment. And we often say it has to be community-led, and community driven. Otherwise, it's just us making up stuff again. This is just briefly kind of our model, but the four points here in this model is that you identify your community, and then with your community, you diagnose what the issues are. Then with your community, you implement interventions. And then with your community, you continue to measure and monitor what those outcomes are. One of the frameworks that we're moving to, and there's actually 45 other health systems in this country now over the last two or three years that have adopted the healthcare anchor network strategy. Being the largest employers typically in our environments, the major focus areas are local hiring, local sourcing on the supply chain side, and then place-based investing. And the place-based investing would be around any of those areas of the social determinants. So, we, along with Geisinger and Kaiser and University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Dignity and now Common Spirit, and just a number of healthcare institutions across this nation now that says this is how we're going to address social determinants. 
this is not where we end, but this is where we start. And, we, and the requirement is that, or the request is that you, you donate up to 1% of your investment dollars that are available to these kinds of activities. I'm fortunate that my system just really in the last two weeks uh, put $50 million into our foundation that's restricted funds for community health initiatives. Not to spend all at once, but to use as leverage to bring other people to the table in order to do this. And I think this is my last slide. We, we also just not just want to do things, but how do we measure the impact? And we all struggle with this, you know, the outcomes, because nothing happens quickly. And so I think as we move forward, you know, with future direction is understanding that there is a return on investment. Uh, it's not your typical financial return on investment, but there is a social return on investment. And I did mention earlier when we were talking that we've been working with a, a MPA student from, from Hopkins School of Public Health, and she did uh, a logic model on our housing initiatives to determine what the return was. And look, using that logic model, for every dollar we spend on housing, the return could be 1.3 all the way up to $3 as a return based on how you measure that. So I'll stop there and uh, we'll have Q&A later. It's fun. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Anna Nuvaj. I come from Rhode Island, uh, Department of Health. And um, as I was listening to the conversations and dialogue prior to me, one of the things that came to mind was, how did we get where we are in Rhode Island right now? Um, and we all have those moments in our professional lives where we, something happens and we believe that uh, we take pause and we look back and we assess uh, uh, where we are. Rhode Island, we did that pause and that assessing of where we, we were around 10 years ago. Um, at the time, I was doing, um, I was in many of the, um, among many things that I was in charge of, I was looking at our uh, Healthy People 2020, 2010, back then, uh, indicators, and uh, really trying to see how we were and how we compare with the rest of the nation. And uh, as everybody else, most likely we made progress in some indicators, we went in the wrong direction in some others, and we were not moving. But most important for us, and what gave us pause, was the fact that when you really deep dive, did a, did a deep dive in the data, the fact that the next generation, my children generation, your children generation, your children, for those of you who have children, and for those of you in the room that are young enough uh, to be that generation, had a lower life expectancy. How is that right? And how is that acceptable? Where did we, as a system, uh, as a state, as a nation, got it so wrong? And I think it has to do with some of the things that we've talked about, the, the things that really impact, influence the term our health beyond what happens in the healthcare system. And so if we truly believe that that was what was at the root cause of that um, non-acceptable trend in data, in population health data, we needed to do something different. And there was no book uh, or no instructions on how to do that. Uh, and uh, there was no funding that tells us how to do that. But if you truly believe, and we stole this uh, framework from a, then CDC director, Dr. Freedom, um, if you truly believe that a comprehensive public health program that achieves population health outcomes needs to have all of those levels of intervention, and if you, uh, any other health department back then did a, an assessment, put this framework on top of their programs, they will realize that most of their investments or, were on that level one, telling people what to do. We are so good at doing that in public health. And that's the approach that has the lowest impact from a population's health perspective. But we had almost no investments at the bottom of that pyramid where it's truly what we've been talking about. So we needed to change and uh, the health equity zones, the model that I wanna talk to you about, it's how in Rhode Island we decided that back then we needed to change. We needed to move from a siloed disease specific approach and investment to more of a place-based approach that was trying to get at the root causes of the disparities, inequalities, and health outcomes. 
And so our health equity zones, um, we really, we pulled funding together because, as I said, there is no funding that comes from the federal government or even from the state in our perspective to do this work. Uh, but at the core, we wanted communities, we wanted to elevate the voice of the, voice of the communities. Uh, we have data, some said not, uh, as was pointed out, sometimes not the most per perfect data, but I truly believe that there is a story and a knowledge at the community level that if you truly elevate that voice and integrate it in the data that you already have, gives you a more complete story. And so we ask our communities to come together to draw a line on a map and really define their zone of intervention, to build, maintain, expand whatever collaborative they already had or to start a new one. We require them to truly be a, a multi-sector collaborative that integrated residents of the place uh, that they were uh, proposing their interventions. And then we ask them to do a baseline assessment, not a needs assessment, but truly an assessment of all at everything that happened at the community level. Through a community prioritization process, define a plan of action, and we implemented that plan of action, supported the implementation of that plan of action. We had broad goals that were traditional public health goals because we are accountable to the funding streams. Uh, but we needed to truly come up with the funding stream, and it was through a braided model. We braided funding from all of those um, different funding streams that you see in there, because we truly believe that if we had a sustainable investment with flexible funding, we'll be able to achieve um, outcomes that truly move the needle. So this is a, uh, a, um, a slide that I'm not gonna go through it. It's the mechanics of how we did it, but I wanted you to have it because if you click on those links, you will see exactly the, how we were able to mix all of those fundings and keep the integrity of the funding uh, intact because that's what graded funding does. And these are the, some of the priorities identified by our communities. Some of them traditional public health outcomes and expected priorities, some of them not so. Uh, things that you'd say we have no uh, funding to address. But here is how it worked four years later, we've had 63% decrease in uh, school absenteeism, or 44% decrease in childhood-led poisoning prevention, or a 24% decrease in teen pregnancy. Those are real outcomes change from a population health perspective. We saw a 36% increase in access to fruits and vegetables. Those things don't happen overnight, and those were results that we had never achieved before. And so some of the outcomes and lessons learned outside of the specific changes in terms of population health, we had so much more increased collaboration both internally and externally. We had an opportunity to leverage resources that has never before happened in our state. Uh, we started with that uh, list of funding streams that you saw, and now today, five years later, we have funding that comes from Medicaid within our state agency, within our state, from the Department of Transportation, from the Department of Mental Health and Behavioral Health, we were able to bring all of those different threads and continue to support those community priorities because there was a community infrastructure that was built and, and that was ready to be invested on. Is this easy? Absolutely not. It required so much change in terms of financial processes and financial uh, accountability that we needed to, to build at the health department's level. Uh, dealing with the federal uh, funders' um, anxiety, both at our programs level and with the federal level, because we were, we were asking them to do something that is not written in the books, according to them, that was not allowed according to known or perceived regulations. Uh, but we did pass two financial audits with no findings, so I guess we did figure it out how to do it right. Uh, and I think uh, I want to stress, uh, as my final slide, part of the dealing with the anxiety, both from our program but also from the feds, has to do with what we talked about, partnerships. Taking the time to really build the partnerships, build the trust of our different programs, build the trust of our federal partners, of our state agencies, to believe that change was indeed possible and to believe that the only way for you to truly change and impact those determinants, not one by one, not at the individual level, but at the community level. It's for us together 
to take responsibility, for us together to agree on a common vision, and then for us together to invest in that vision. Mm -hmm. That's what we've been able to achieve in Rhode Island, and I think it doesn't matter that we are the smallest state in the nation. Uh, I do believe that uh, whenever there's a will and there is a recognition of our social responsibility towards the people that we serve, we find a way to make it work. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and that's a perfect segue into the uh, the um, more like federal budget perspective. Let me just ask you kind of a quick question because it really sparked a question. Something you said, you talked about building that community infrastructure, and then that's what enabled you to use the Medicaid, transportation, public health, behavioral health kind of funding. So, like, which comes first? You know, the do, do you have to blend the funding first to make it possible for that community infrastructure, or was it the fact that you just decided? nope, we're gonna come together, build this infrastructure, and then that's what um, has enabled you to, to create these outcomes. So it was more of the deciding first we needed to do something different, uh, and then uh, we did an assessment of the kind of funding that we had, and making it clear for the community that we had, limit, we had funding to support the infrastructure, but in terms of implementing the plan of action, it will depend on the funding that we had and the priorities that they had, and we tried to match that's what, why it's braided. We then matched at the activity level from their work plans the different funding streams based on what they had. Thank you so much. All right, well, Kathy Stack. Yeah, take that was us a away. great setup. So I just want to remind everyone here that these guys are really atypical. <laughs> I think often people in, in DC say, oh, well, they've done it there. Why isn't everybody doing it? And it's just really, really hard. Um, so, my experience, uh, it's my 28 years at OMB, I um, was not in health. I was in education, labor, and the non-health social services. Um, and it was my job to enforce all those budget rules that make sure that every dollar that Congress appropriates is only used for the authorized purposes. Um, and that sets in motion a whole set of things um, that make it really hard to do this kind of work. Uh, during the Obama administration, I had the privilege of working on some initiatives, pay for success and performance partnership pilots that were intended to liberate and help state and local communities through innovations to overcome all of these struggles. Um, and so I wanted to share some lessons from those experiences. So first, just overview um, for budget infrastructure challenges very quickly. Um, the program silos that originate in statute um, are further prescribed by agency regulations on what's allowable with funds. Um, there's allowable activities, there's eligible entities, there's periods of availability uh, where certain dollars can only be used by uh, during a certain period. Um, and there's two main kinds of funding. We have mandatory funds through um, uh, authorizing committees that provide permanent authority like TANF, Medicaid, SNAP, uh, and there's some certainty there because the, the statutes are multi-year and state and local grantees understand how much money is going to be coming under what conditions. Um, then there are discretionary appropriations where the authorizing statutes are provided in an authorizing bill um, and the appropriators on an annual basis decide how much money to spend. In both cases, mandatory and discretionary, there is a period of availability that sets, that's set up uh, that requires dollars to be recorded against the, the right year. Um, there's a vast bureaucracy in the federal government at OMB, at GAO, in the agencies, and then down at the state and local level, um, making sure that the dollars are properly accounted for so that you can show that they are only being used for allowable costs. There is an army of auditors who go out to make sure that the documentation is proper and that all the dollars are being used for allowable costs. <coughs> and there is an amazing fear <laughs> um, at the grantee level that if you don't have that documentation, you may have to turn back that money. And it really creates a, a very risk averse culture um, where people are focused on 
how do I comply with the rules rather than how do I step back, think about how all the dollars coming into my community could be used more effectively and we could do some creative work like Rhode Island is doing. So um, the two models that I was involved in, um, one was pay for success uh, and the other was performance partnership pilots for disconnected use. Um, these were both things that were sort of done midway through the Obama administration. They were bipartisan, they got congressional support, um, and we learned a lot from them. So first on pay for success, um, these were projects that were set up to fund effective social services through outcomes-based financing contracts. Uh, if service providers um, achieved the predetermined outcomes that they had contracted for, um, they were then able to get um, payments from the government based on those outcomes, and those outcomes were usually associated with things that would save costs uh, because these were prevention activities that would reduce downstream uh, government costs. So the major projects, um, there are frankly only about 30 that have happened so far in the United States, the CIPRA, legislation, Social Impact Partnerships for Pay for Results Act that Congress passed um, in 2018 is setting up a new pipeline of more projects, but most of the projects were in um, mental uh, or maternal and child health, homelessness, recidivism, um, and early childhood. But there, we've learned that while we'd all hoped for lots of transformational initiatives, it turns out to be really, really hard to put together a pay for success deal. And the challenges were, first of all, there's a very weak evidence base. Um, and that's something that we have in the area of social determinants of health too. We, we wanna believe that these prevention strategies are gonna improve outcomes and save money, um, but we don't have a body of rigorous research that tells us exactly what those are and how to do them and what population they work for. Um, there were few jurisdictions that had the resources to take on the complicated resource intensive um, design of pay for success projects with external partners. You almost always needed philanthropic partners to fill the gap. And the biggest thing that we've heard over and over again is the data. Um, few jurisdictions had the data, the ability to integrate their data across programs and the analytics capacity to really understand who were those high super utilizers we should be targeting and how are we gonna measure the results we get. Um, also with pay for success, these were like innovative projects that were developed outside the system. And many of them, no matter how successful they are, there's not a path to scale because they were so different than the way we normally run programs that people don't know how you would take that in these existing program streams to, to fund scale up. Performance partnership pilots. Um, this was an authority that was enacted in 2014 in appropriations language. It's still around, it's been there for five years now. Um, it allows uh, youth serving programs in labor, HHS, education, um, justice, and HUD um, to, well, state and local governments can take those funding streams and pool them, uh, blend them, and get waivers from program requirements in order to test out more effective interventions for at-risk youth that improve education, employment, and other well-being outcomes. Um, it's up to 10 pilots a year. And the Department of Education has been the lead, but there's an interagency group that runs the program. Here again, the intent was, we want transformational initiatives, um, but the results have really fallen far short of that because of implementation challenges. So first, we learned from this that myths reign supreme at the state and local level. <laughs> um, to, be, uh, to apply for a pilot, a state or local government had to document the barriers that were getting in their way uh, at the federal level and then write justifications for waivers. Well, about 80% of the waiver requests that came in were for things that they did not need waivers for. And I, the Rhode Island is perfect as an example. Like so many people thought in order to braid money across programs, you need a waiver. Well, there's other ways to do it, but that information is not out there. Um, 
there was very poor knowledge about available funding streams. A lot of communities wanted to apply, and they said, can you tell us what money comes into our community? Because we really don't know. Um, that information is so siloed at the federal level, well, it's siloed at the state and local level as well. And like Pay for Success, very low data and analytics capacity. Um, another program w problem with this program, it was kind of below the radar. And frankly, it wasn't a priority for the federal staff because Congress wasn't on their case saying make this a priority to help state and local governments. So it became so bureaucratic and slow that a lot of um, potential grantees just walked away and said, not worth it. So if you haven't, how many people here have heard about the um, HR 4004, which is the Social Determinants Accelerator Act? It's been introduced in the House on a bipartisan basis. Um, Sherry Bustos, um, uh, Representatives Cole, McGovern, and McMorris Rogers were the primary sponsors. Um, and it's small, it's $25 million, uh, it has two main components. But there are design features here that if implemented well, could really take the lessons from pay for success and performance partnerships and do something um, to move the ball so that more jurisdictions can do this kind of thing. Um, it requires, it sets up grants for state and local governments to develop uh, social determinants accelerator plans. And the components of those plans are very similar to the components that were in performance partnership pilots or pay for success. You identified a high need population, high cost. What are those measurable health and social outcomes that the project would achieve? Uh, look for interventions that are informed by research, um, but also you're going to build new research by embedding strong evaluations in whatever you set up. Um, making sure that you have the capacity to link data across programs so that you can both coordinate care and do evaluations. Um, and unlike pay for success, these plans would require um, a strategy for scaling with existing resources. Again, going back to the Rhode Island example, like if you figured out how to take these dollars and leverage them. Um, and in this case, you'd be also looking for plans that are gonna leverage existing waiver authorities. Right now, we often do waivers like within a program, but this could be a chance to work with the feds to figure out how do you take multiple waiver authorities that exist across a range of programs and put them together to do something much more impactful. So the other piece of it is there is a council. It's an interagency council with the usual sort of health and social services agencies, but it also has state and local uh, representatives and experts in policy and research that would be um, helpful additions. Uh, and the council is charged with providing coordinated technical assistance to state and local governments to help them understand how to leverage existing resources. Right now in the federal government, it is nobody's job to think about how to help jurisdictions pull all these resources together to do the innovative stuff that these guys are doing. No one's job. It would be the council's job. Um, and there would be accountability in terms of an uh, annual report to Congress on the progress and activities. There's also a provision in there that requires the council to survey the state and local governments to say, how are we doing on our technical assistance and how could we improve? Um, too often, federal agencies treat state and local governments as um, distant uh, doers, you do this, rather than as partners that together we're gonna do this. Um, so my hope, again, I'm, an, I'm a silver lining person. If implemented well, what could you get out of this? Um, you would have a new, hopefully more effective model for intergovernmental cross-agency collaboration, um, where both sides are accepting responsibility for co-creating better solutions for using existing resources to go back to I'm our point over here. Um, you'd have ready to implement strategies coming out of these plans for high uh, inter interventions with high return on investment, um, integrated data and analytics capacity, and rigorous evaluation plans that are developed with researchers from the beginning so you know how at the end of the day you're gonna learn whether these strategies are better than the status quo. Um, and then if these are projects are launched, you get proof points. You get a range of proof points that vary by community and state. 
on how to make these uh, existing resources work more effectively. Um, and those become um, models that a, a lot of jurisdictions can follow because they can find sister organizations, sister jurisdictions that, that look like them. Um, but the reality here, if not implemented well, um, well, at least we get more lessons about the shortcomings of federal innovation initiatives <laughs> and what to do better next time. So, but you've got it all figured out. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, Len. Hi, Sarah. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, when you started your conversation with Karen, Sarah, I was impressed with the question sort of why now, how come everybody's already into social determinants of health? And, and I would say, yeah, it's true. The whole world has discovered social determinants of health. Even economists have discovered social determinants of health. And of course, when economists discover something, we think we invented it, and so we're bringing the math to it. But I'll just say, you know, at the end of the day, um, it, it's really true that social workers have known this stuff for about 120 years, and so it imparts a bit of humility to economists, which is rare. I'll just observe and, and go on and say, uh, here, here's how I got to this place. About five years ago, I can honestly say I couldn't spell social determinants of health. I didn't know what it meant. I thought it was this touchy-feely thing upstream from where life mattered with, you know, payment reform and insurance reform. And then I heard my incredible co-author, Lauren Taylor, give a talk. And how many of you have heard of Elizabeth Bradley? Yeah, Bradley was the woman who, when she was at the Yale School of Public Health, figured out that the United States spends way less on social services and way more on health. And most of the OECD countries do exactly the opposite. Right, they spend way less on us on health and more on social. And, and she figured out that it's the ratio of social to health that may actually matter. And Lauren was her undergraduate research assistant. And Betsy figured out how smart Lauren was and figured out how to cheat and get her an MPH in one year. And then Lauren's boyfriend, uncharacteristically, was big and fast enough as a Yale football player, got drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs. So Lauren goes to Kansas City and pretends to be an NFL wife while she edits Betsy's book, which became The American Healthcare Paradox, which explains all this social health stuff. And um, basically did such a good job, Betsy made her co-author, so Lauren had a book at 24. Then Shane got cut, but he lasted two years more than me, so I'm still impressed. They come back to the East Coast, and Lauren does what she wanted to do, which was change the world, so she goes to Harvard Divinity School. Turns out, she finished Harvard Divinity School, she can marry you and bury you, but it turns out there's no pulpit at the end of Harvard Divinity School. You just sort of are supposed to go off and change the world, so what does she really care about? She cares about health policy, so now she's in the PhD program in the medical school, which Joe Newhouse created after finishing a RAND experiment called Healthcare Policy. She's going to finish in a year. I saw her speak for Betsy at a conference about three years ago, and I said, wow, I got to meet this one. And I just went up and said, hi, you know, I'd like to get to know you a little bit and learn what you're up to. Two years ago, I said, if you will teach me this social determinant stuff, I will find us an economic model to incentivize investment upstream. I was bullshitting, I had no idea. I figured, you know, I could make something up, how hard could this be? So she did her job in about a month, and then I thought, ooh, I gotta go do this. So I started digging, 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 and we wrote this paper a year ago, and you know, stuff happened. Let me just say that um, I promised Sarah I wouldn't use equations, so I have pictures here, and here's the deal. Okay, if you think about investing in, in housing, in food, in transportation, in complex case management, that's gonna help people. It's gonna help a lot of people individually, but it's also gonna help a lot of people what we call downstream, right? It's gonna make them healthier, maybe even better able to participate in their society and even go to work and create tax revenue, maybe get arrested less often, go to healthcare so providers way less often, save healthcare money, also save city hall money because a lot of the homeless, for example, get arrested a lot. And if you figure out a way to contain their chaos in their lives, you can actually save enough money to pay for the housing. So that's what that's about. This is about this sort of notion that, look, giving the right stuff to the right people at the right time benefits many, many players downstream. And that turns out to be what we call in economics of public good. It benefits multiple people downstream. Turns out when you have a public good situation, all these different beneficiaries, no one creature is going to want to invest enough because it can't capture the return on the investment, and that creates what we call a free rider problem. 
turns out, it took a while to find this, but it turns out my profession, God bless it, invented a, a solution to the free rider problem in the 1970s. And it kind of got buried in highly mathematical general equilibrium theory and forgotten once Reagan won because it really was designed to sort of substitute for government. People were worried about too much government. Once Reagan won, people quit worrying about too much government. Now the problem is too little government. But the point is it got buried in this highly mathematical corner of the, of the universe. But I went to grad school in the 70s. I can read that shit. It's amazing. I had no idea I could remember, and so I found it. Oh, my God. So there are two conditions that make this thing work. One is there's got to be a local stakeholder group. We call it a coalition. could be a working group that recognizes simultaneously there's a potential collective benefit and an individual benefit. Maybe that benefit is financial, maybe it's not, but it's a benefit nevertheless that flows to these multiple players. That group has to exist. Number two, there has to be a trusted broker. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, but let me just say these conditions, particularly this coalition of stakeholders, looking upstream, exist in our nation. Karen's talked to most of them. They're all out there. Why are they out there? I think three reasons. Number one, readmissions penalties. Readmissions penalty says that if, I, if a patient's discharged from Hospital A and goes into Hospital B, Hospital A gets dinged, which meant, oh, my God, we have to collaborate. And they started to do that all over the country. Number two, opioids. Opioids brought criminal justice, family services, ER docs in the same room trying to solve a family's problem. Once you get naloxone spread around, all the solutions are upstream, all of them because it's all about the family and where they live and work. And the third condition that made this turbocharged activity out there is Medicaid expansion. Because Medicaid expansion put, for the first time, the homeless on the rolls of Medicare managed care organizations, Medicaid managed care organizations. And so suddenly you had this powerful incentive to figure out, so who are these community health workers and how can they help us? How can we learn to talk to the homeless in a much more efficient way and try to manage so those three things created these conditions. Therefore, let me tell you, there's a hunger out there for upstream solutions that I have never, ever, ever seen. And finally, here's how the model works. Basically, think about it this way. The problem with the free rider problem is no individual that's going to benefit wants to reveal what they're willing to pay. Why? Because I would rather have the other hospital pay for it. I'd rather have the health plan pay for it. I'd rather have somebody, government should do, somebody should do, not me, surely not. So what if you had a trusted broker, someone to whom you might be willing to reveal what you're actually willing to pay if you could keep that knowledge private? The United Way, by the way, is a pretty classic case of somebody who can play this role in about an hour. So could a local philanthropy, so could a local academic if they were trusted or not. But the point is you gotta have someone to whom you will whisper. The, so the trusted broker takes all the individual willingnesses to pay, adds them up in secret. If the sum of the willingness to pay exceed the cost of the program, then sports fans, you got a project worth doing. Also, here's the real trick. If you've got a project worth doing, that is to say you've got a surplus, you can develop prices for everybody to pay such that no one pays as much as they bid. Everyone gets to share in the surplus Therefore, it generates an ROI. Therefore, it is sustainable because it's based on self-interest. The economist has entered the room, and that's why it might actually work. Okay, so we have this little project. You know, it's a crazy idea. I agree. And so we went to foundations. They said, Lynn's crazy idea. Okay, but let's teach it, and that's what we're doing. We're teaching it to the country. You two can come and join. We're, we're halfway through, three-fourths way through our little webinars. Project's called CAPTCHA. You can get all that stuff. But the point is, usually when you write a paper with economic content, I'll just say in 40 years of experience, you typically get four emails, okay? The first one says, you should just go ahead and retire and coach football. That, that's actually applicable in my case. The second one says, you should you have used a different data set, you should have used a different mathematical technique, a different way of proving this thing. You know, it's, it's crazy. Economists are nasty people. And in this case, we had 20 communities come to us and say, can we do this here? Our third webinar was yesterday. We had people on there from 29 states, 171 different zip codes, 95 counties, from Hawaii to Massachusetts, from San Diego to Tidewater, Virginia. 
I have never seen anything like this. And it's, the paper's clever. It ain't that clever, okay? It has to do with the urgency that people feel on how to solve these common upstream problems. Okay, so what are we doing here? Well, basically, we're looking at communities, taking all the data we can pull, taking what they can provide. We'll pull the CHNAs and all that stuff from the local community, and they will assess as they're going through this, might this model work for them? Might this be a way to use local collective financing in such a way that you can essentially braid and blend and, and make the world work? We're going to assess their um, uh, capabilities, and, and, and they'll assess whether they want to do this. We'll go visit some of these communities, and uh, we'll do this in, in sort of late tw uh, 19 and early 20, and then um, we'll help them write proposals to do the TA, to, to technical assistance, to uh, implement the thing. So here are the big questions. Everything moves at the speed of trust. This thing doesn't work unless there's a trusted broker. This thing doesn't work unless each individual stakeholder is willing to acknowledge, A, there is a personal benefit for them, and B, that they're willing to put some of their skin in the game or some of their money on the table. We don't know for sure that that can be nurtured enough and channeled. We don't really need government to step in and solve this problem. We do need government to get out of the way, and by that I mean to do a lot of what Kathy was just describing, make clear what you can do now, and maybe, just maybe, grant a little waiver around the edges here, there, and yon so that you can let people do what they want to do. It's in their self-interest, but they feel like they can't, and they're terrified of the auditors coming and preventing them from, from doing it. And then also there's a little problem of Medicaid being somewhat, shall we say, solicitous of getting their savings back because they're strained. Everybody knows that. Well, if what Medicaid does after allowing creative things to happen is come in the next year and cut the rates, to take the healthcare savings out, then suddenly you've lost the funding for the upstream work. So we've got to work all that out. Will the CFOs in the real big healthcare institutions actually believe what the literature says? Literature is not great. Karen just reviewed a bunch of it. You're going to see it in a couple of weeks. It's not great. <clears throat> it is a Not that bad, <coughs> but it is targeted, right? So you can show how Housing First can save money for specific populations, not for the homeless in general, okay? So stuff can be oversold, but you can also target it and, and be very smart about it. Will the CFOs believe any of this? I don't know. We're still working on that. Will fundamentally people believe they can collaborate again. At the end of the day, this solution was created to get around government, to go around, to avoid the need to increase taxation to solve collective problems. It's using existing resources to solve those problems in a way that the locals want to collaborate. Our job, our tool to make this happen, right? Question is, can they believe that it's possible to collaborate again, because we've lost faith. The reason government can't do it, one of the reasons pay for success didn't work, government doesn't have money to write the check. Doesn't have money to write the check because people have lost faith in government, which means people really have lost faith in the ability to do collaborative things together. So we have to help them believe again. We are the change we need, thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. So we have time for some questions, and it is freezing in here, so we need your energy. <laughs> we need your questions. We're sorry it's so cold in here. Um, write your questions down or stand up or raise your hand. All right, I want to um, kind of warm us up with, with a question, though. So, I mean, wow, so many important topics that we've covered. And, um, and I want to, um, you know, there's been so much focus on the state and local level and what state and gov local governments can do and, like, what the federal government um, can or cannot do to to, to help, and, um, and so I just I want to start there, which which is you know how important is that that the state and local governments get this help because so often I think at the federal level and kind of having come from the hill we think of things as like either Medicaid policy or Medicare policy or you know private coverage or you know um, appropriations and we kind of think about things in this like balkanized way, so you know, how, how do you square that circle? How do you get the help where it's needed, where it's gonna be the most effective um, 
you know, use of taxpayer dollars and um, have the most effective outcomes. And Len, can I start with you since you ended? <laughs> So um, I would say everything that we are doing, and one reason I'm very excited, you may be able to tell about this work, is precisely because the focus is local. That doesn't mean exclusively local, but it means you start at the local level because what I've observed, um, basically, is that our national politics are broken, our state politics are somewhat but not always better, but at the local level, it doesn't matter how you vote, everybody wants it to work where they live and work and play and pray. And so fundamentally, it's a much more fun place to be. Second, I think it's true the focus there identifies what elements of the state and federal need to be at the table to cooperate. Like I said, it's, this isn't going, my thing's not gonna work, no one, but it's gonna work unless Medicaid gives the freedom to the MCOs to do what they're gonna wanna do in their own self-interest. And same thing for Medicare Advantage. There's a lot of the target populations here, frail elderly come to mind, duels are natural. You need Medicare Advantage. They've both made, I will say, uh, the Trump administration has made great progress of late in granting more and more freedom for both of those actors. But by the way, it's not identical and it's not enough. So what I want is the conversation to center on the local, have the locals tell the state and the Fed what they need, and have Kathy Stack help them navigate that waiver through <laughs> of the bureaucracy. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let me let me ask one of our um, you know state local um, um, experts to to take a stab at that question, and then um, Anna, do you want to so start? I Absolutely. I think uh, definitely there are barriers at the federal level. More flexibility, less siloed granting would be appreciated. At the same time, I believe most sometimes those barriers are more perceived by the states than real barriers. And so if you look at any federal grant that comes from the agencies, they all refer to achieving equity. They all say that they want to address the social determinants of health. They all say that they need to eliminate disparities. It's there. So it's for us to say, to tell our story and put on that grant application response the things that you believe are gonna facilitate your processes. I tell the story of has in every single application that I submit to the federal government. It doesn't matter if it's obesity, if it's tobacco, if it's diabetes, whatever is the topic, I tell the story of has as this is how I'm gonna address that problem. When they approve my grant application, they automatically approve the use of that funding into that infrastructure and to that way. So I think we states, can, we cannot expect or wait for the perfect solution. We can challenge ourselves and at the same time challenge our federal government and stress, extract all of that relationship so you do get to a practical solution. I call myself a practitioner of public health. And as such, I do not waste time trying to figure out the perfect approach, uh, the perfect full understanding of the rules. I challenge those on a daily basis. And then I engage in that conversation uh, from a perspective of a trusted partnership. So Kathy, could, could you mentioned, you know, I think you're both kind of singing from the same page here. I mean, what could the federal government do to just from the get-go, you know, within even existing authority, like help them, to, the state, local uh, folks, to understand better what they can and can't do? So, um, <laughs> or is that impossible? <laughs> I'm just going to offer an example, uh, anecdote, actually, from July. Um, so, we at the I was part of the National Academy of Public Administration, and we set up a sort of a problem-solving forum. Um, around ways to improve grants accountability to focus more on outcomes and less on compliance. And we had a conversation uh, that involved the um, head of human services for the state of Virginia, uh, the head of the family services department for Fairfax County, and the federal OMB team that oversees all of the grants and financial management compliance rules. Um, and from the Virginia folks, state and county, um, they told us what are the things that they're doing to be more outcome focused. It was very data focused, um, trying to bring down the data, uh, uh, together the data to understand the population and measure outcomes. Um, and then they listed a set of things that they wanted to do but they couldn't do because of federal requirements. 
Well, the OMB folks in the room said, you know, I think probably most of the things you want to do, you can already do. Um, so that was illuminating. It's like everybody, whoa, really? Um, but to really get clarity on that, you've got to have the people from OMB at the table who set the policy on grants management compliance and the programmatic staff from the agencies who, and, and the attorneys from the agencies who know what the statutes allow. It's very hard to get that group of people together unless there is someone at a very high level in the White House or OMB um, saying this should be a priority, that it's your job to create those forums so that you can be responsive to what state and local governments are facing. Um, and that's where Congress potentially could try to create you know, an imperative to, for the executive branch to organize itself that way, um, or you know, um, leadership out of the White House could do the same. Thank you. Um, so, so we have a couple questions um, here about kind of the return on investment, and that's something that I think just about everyone on the panel talked about, and whether it be financial return on investment or social or you know health return on investment. Um, so, you know, um, one question here is, you know, how do you talk about um, and best describe return on investment or think about it when um, it seems like you know billions of dollars are going to be needed to invest in social care networks first? So. Um, so one, um, Len, you had one very concrete way of answering that, and then I want to see if maybe Bill and, um, and Dr. Ross have a, have a thought on that. And so I would start with looking at what's happening now and, and look at something uh, or a phenomenon as disparate as watching Centene, which is the nation's largest for-profit MCO company. They're building a thing they call a social bridge which is their version of connecting social and healthcare sectors that 211 in San Diego has created. So they're doing it as a for-profit company because they think there's gonna be value in managing their Medicaid patients. Kaiser Permanente is doing the exact same thing with a platform called Unite Us, and they're gonna put their little Unite Us stamp everywhere. Kaiser has a big number of enrollees, exact same concept to connecting because both of these healthcare for-profit, non-profit, big institutions think if they came to know more about where people are going now, they will understand better how to manage their own patients. So the truth is these services are being delivered now. They're just not being delivered at scale. and They're not being delivered necessarily in a tailored way. People going to food banks, they're not getting medically tailored meals. And so there's a lot of sort of tweaking that could happen that can help you. But the key, and it comes back to Karen's point and everybody's point really, if, if you don't have data to track the impact of the intervention on people, you cannot generate the ROI. And that's why for us, the data is a prerequisite for us to go in. Everything you heard today from your incredible panel, I will say I've been doing these a long time. This is the best one I've ever seen, except for me. But anyway, I'll just say, <laughs> you know, these I learned a lot. I was writing down. So they've already figured out how to track data where they are, and that's absolutely central to prove anything to any CFO. Thank you. So Bill, you started off talking about the data and like how we're actually how you created this system. So can you yeah, shed some light I think, on this? and it's a couple of things because I because I, I appreciate Kaiser's venture into the the NINS, wanting an enterprise wide solution. We work closely with them actually in most of their regions, making sure that they connect to the the that social service system, right? So that is often the underrepresented, the underserved, and so making sure the medicalization of social services doesn't happen, and that's my point, and we've been working with them around that a, a referral doesn't mean an outcome, and an eligibility, I mean, there is a plethora of programs that exist out there. Um, that doesn't mean members, clients, patients will receive those services, so, um, so that outcome, and we, we see that ourselves, I think, um, so, which thankfully we're involved in that project throughout several places in, in San Diego and applaud, applaud what they're trying to do because they are thinking it from the social service infrastructure and what they need to do to boost that. Um, for us in San Diego, matching our CIE technology and then working with our hospital systems, Sharp being one of them, and I, I think uh, I forget it was I think it was Len that talked about community health benefit dollars is we were able to make some pilot projects around readmissions, penalties, but for the first few years, that didn't really translate to 
a payment model. It was community benefit do dollars that did, did finally transition to operational dollars. So it's an ongoing project, both involved in two parts. Our community information exchange having that data across sectors that, that, um, that SHARP, that CIE and other partners can work in. And, um, and a navigation around that coordination of when the resources weren't working. So uh, in that project, we were able to take a certain population that the healthcare system was working for and what we were working for and actually bringing down the, the admission. So we were able to make a case for it. So I think there is a movement to that, that, that more value-based, that it's more than just the penalties and moving into the operational that this is working. So that's part of our model of kind of selling why, why this works. Um, but I, I do think Kaiser is on the, um, Kaiser Permanente is, is, uh, is on the forefront because they are thinking of, of the nonprofit infrastructure too in those communities and what they'll need to be successful. Thank you. So Dr. Ross, you're, we've, we've actually heard about readmissions penalties a few times. We've talked about communi community benefit and investment and you, you had some thoughts on that. So um, can you share like, how do you think about investing in um, what's gonna create the, the best outcomes and how do you think about the, those measures of success um, and, and how to tie that to the investments? All right, so you know, when you were asking earlier about the role of the, I guess, federal government versus state government, in the way grants typically get allocated, I would say those become catalysts or accelerators for a lot of the work that we wanna do. But the sustainable part ties to the point that Lynn was making where you have to have the, the we could say the local stakeholder coalition and the trusted broker. In our world, particularly with the healthcare anchor network uh, framework, it's about the health system becoming that trusted broker and bringing others to the table, whether that's public or private or, or uh, other philanthropic funders as well in order to do that because that over the long haul makes it sustainable. You know, grants run out and the well runs dry. But um, the, the, ROI, the ROI piece that we've demonstrated time and time again, uh, we had a similar health enterprise zone initiative in Maryland. And we were able to demonstrate in five regions of the state that we reduced ER visits, reduced avoidable admissions and readmissions, and we addressed chronic disease states uh, in that population. The challenge with ROI is that it, it, if you haven't attributed or, 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 or uh, um, you know, assigned population, you can track and follow those things. But if you're trying to do that for a community mm -hmm. or a public where you don't have access to those kinds of data and tracking, then it's much harder you know, to define that, that return on investment. But I think you know, we've shown in healthcare that addressing the social determinants really does make a difference. And what I would say, all of our previous, you know, David Letterman used to have a segment called Stupid Human Tricks. <laughs> all, of our, all of our previous stupid human tricks around just medicine really didn't make that kind of difference. And, and I just want to comment on one other thing because a couple of times we've said or, or it's been commented about CFOs. Uh, I don't leave this to our CFOs. You know, the, uh, Studer, who's written a lot, you know, he had a phrase in there that said, the fish rots from the head. And the point is that if the CEOs or presidents aren't really out front in driving the need for the addressing social determinants and the impact that it has, not just on their organizations, but communities, then it also won't be sustainable. But it, it's not a CFO issue from my perspective. It's a CEO. It's a CEO issue. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a, oh, um, let me give, get, um, give, give Joyce a chance to ask a question and then, um, yep. Well, while we're <laughs> getting the mic to, yep. We got a couple questions on evidence and um, I wanna get to those as well. So, but go ahead. Hi, Joyce Frieden, MedPage Today. Um, a lot of you have talked about uh, collecting data, particularly tracking individual people within the system and I wondered, uh, if privacy concerns had come up and how those were addressed. Hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as we ventured into what we thought was going to be 
our own client management system, and then a shared community system. I will say that was sort of my last comments of like the, the whirlwind of the investment we've needed to make in uh, consulting. And, and again, no st there is no standardization around uh, social service data. Um, I have heard the strangest things from the strangest people saying, there isn't, you don't need to have any, there is no privacy around housing information if you're entering this system. You don't need a consent. Um, you don't, uh, th these are things that, that we heard a long time. Um, you know, we decided in San Diego because of the influence of our county and our own health in exchange to go to the highest standard we could. So we have a consent that is a social consent that, that is the client that owns that, that can participate at an agency or even through 211. We have authorizations that then allow us because of our, our um, interactions with healthcare systems and EHRs that are a higher level of actual authorizations and we're working on even a higher level of behavioral health authorizations in you know, very, very, small, very small pockets of where that's needed. But I would say one of the things of working so long was the expense, the number of people when I mentioned the, you know, we have a, pri a privacy and a security officer, the amount of controls that we've had to put in place, the additional kind of software for security, the, um, the checks and balances of not only our staff, system, sales force, and so HIPAA controls, but every person with a role-based permission from every one of those agencies that enters that is our responsibility. The insurance requirements on that, the, the risk around any type of data breach. The, so, um, so it's an ongoing, and, and in California now with our HIEs and uh, counties is you know, consent management period and consent management repositories and at what level do you put that back in the hands of, it, it can always be revoked, but at, you know, there should be several levels of consent. Could it be a social consent and authorization? Is it a behavioral health consent? you know, that, that ex expands that. So I, I would say it's, you know, not knowing what we were getting completely into at the eight years ago mark, that it's probably in our biggest investment in the ongoing conversation. And one more piece to it is the identity management across systems, right? So I, I mentioned we use an Informatica, an ETL that takes this data and matches Billy York, William York, William Lester York, Huckleberry Finn, and you know, <laughs> map, you know from systems and brings you together that always doesn't confirm identity. And so another piece that we're investing dollars in think tanking is identity management across, across multiple systems. So for us, that's probably, th that's the number one conversation that we have in our, in our um, uh, uh, community every day. Thanks, I, I just wanna um, share that states and counties are all over the map on privacy yeah. right now. And there are the outliers like San Diego, Washington State, South Carolina, um, that have figured out how to comply with all the privacy rules. Mm -hmm. Some are using consent, some are using um, data warehouses that strip identifiers, but there are technology solutions that allow you to comply with privacy rules and bring the data together to do all kinds of analytics and targeting and even care coordination. Um, but the vast majority of jurisdictions are confused. We have different <laughs> privacy laws coming from different agencies. It's no one's job, again, at the federal level to say, here's how you bring all this data together and do it in a way that won't get you in trouble. Um, but it is possible. Thanks. Well, we have only a few minutes left, so I'm going to try. We have a few questions that, are, um, that I'm going to try to kind of combine, um, and, and hopefully we can do like a, a quick, uh, the Top Chef, like lightning quick round. quick fire challenge, lightning mm -hmm. round. So um, um, let's talk about measures of success. How are we going to know we've succeeded? And um, there, were, there was a, a really good question here about the evidence base and kind of the short term versus the long term. We're, we always want quick results, but um, that doesn't, you know, uh, it's not always possible. So how are we going to know that we have succeeded with good evidence? Who would like to start? Well, I can tell you that in Rhode Island, one of the ways that we were able to break the funding was making sure that every uh, categorical funding that we used, we select evidence-based um, initiatives and that we created a menu of activities that were 
evidence base for the community to, to choose from. So that gave us that accountability that is needed from a funding perspective. The other thing, it's really collecting the data to be able to demonstrate results. We have two levels of results at the community level, they're according to their work plan with the kind of data that I've showed. And then we also have at the state level where we aggregate the data to tell the success story of the has at the state level. Uh, and that's also some of the data that we have. So those are the two that we do. Thanks. You wanna go next? I, I think there's some great work being done. You know, as somebody mentioned the Gravity Project. Um, I, I think that by gravity, um, Robert Wood Johnson's data across sectors for health, and there, there are many groups of collaboration that are working there. Uh, the US, uh, uh, UCSF, SIREN, which is the Social uh, Interventions Research and Evaluation Network, are doing great work. But again, what we're seeing in collaborative, this is in San Diego 211 CIE has done nothing on, on their own. So uh, it's great to be able to talk up here and represent that. But this has been a collaboration and uh, bringing in experts from all over the country. It is really interesting on the grant applications and in philanthropy where the research gets crossed out and unfunded. Um, so to either vet or continue to vet, so you know whether you know different parts of these things. Um, there are a lot of great evidence-based practices already, but we're seeing a trend where that nope, don't do that. Just stay and do this, and you know which is not exactly moving the innovation of this data sharing and, and outcomes forward. And, and, and that's not just us seeing that, we are part of many collaborative H, um, applications throughout the state and even with those other partners across the country and it seems like that's just X'd out and they'll fund a part of the program. So I think it, it needs a little bit work from, you know, and, and it's mostly philanthropy that seems interested but seems to be removing that out of the, the Thank funding. You. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ross, yeah, how will we know? If yeah, I would, I would just add for, for health systems, for. In any healthcare system in your area, you should be able to go online and see their community health needs assessment. But it's not just the needs assessment, there is an implementation plan required. So you should be able to monitor year to year to see what they said they were gonna implement mm. and the outcomes they were looking to achieve and whether or not they did. So that, that should be public information that allows you to track that as well. Internally, it's part of our key performance indicators. So our leadership, we're incentivized around our KPIs for things that are related to social determinants. And so that, so there's a short-term piece that's really operational, and then there's a longer-term piece around our CHNAs and things like the Robert Wood Johnson County Health you know, indicators, et cetera. But those are much longer term, and a lot of people have to be playing together to really get those outcomes. Thank you. Kathy? So, um, one of the things in the Obama administration that I and others worked on was how to improve the quality of uh, rigorous research and lower the costs. And there, for a long time, was this perception that randomized control trials were impossible or unethical or too costly. Um, and what we did is we tried to create incentives and partnerships for people at the state and local rec level to recognize that, first of all, RCTs are not that costly if you use administrative data. And to the extent that you're building capacity like San Diego is building to link data sets, it becomes much less costly for researchers to come in and partner with government. Um, there are researchers, academic researchers, that would die to be part of a exciting study on how to increase the return on investment. Uh, and when you're playing in the social determinant space, there's potential for huge return, you know, maternal and child health, um, things that, you know, cost $75,000 a day to keep a kid in the neonatal natal unit. If you can avoid that with upstream prevention um, and you can demonstrate that with a control and a treatment group, um, it doesn't mean you're being unethical to deny services to a control group. It means what you're doing is saying, as we start a strategy, Let's test it out with a subpopulation of those and find a comparable comparison group so we really can have a rigorous test. And when you get that evidence with an RCT, there's nothing more powerful as far as changing the minds of policymakers that they need to invest in those things that have been demonstrated to work. Thank you. Yeah, the coolest thing um, 
uh, along those lines is this notion of step wedge. And this step wedge is a way to do a randomized trial where it may be unethical to deny the services forever. It was invented by epidemiologists when they figured out a drug was working so well, they thought they should give it to everybody in the trial as opposed to wait you know, for cancer and stuff that really matters. Well, same thing in, in social determinant space. You start in one neighborhood, you start in one building, and if you prove it with a rigorous control group, then you've got the justification to expand it to everybody, and you just phase it in in a way that actually makes sense. But I, I wanna go back to Anna's point. If you don't collect the data, you have no hope. And so at the end of the day, you are only gonna get this done where people have come to the state of nirvana to understand they need to have these data. And I think that's expanding and I think it's growing and these technology tools are gonna make it more possible over time. And the examples that y'all demonstrate, as long as you got Kathy's memo on how to get the feds to bless it. <laughs> Great, well, um, thank you so much to all of you um, on our panel. Thank you to Karen DeSalvo for joining us earlier um, and for sticking with us. Thank you for you, you all for sticking with us and um, hope you learned a lot and um, certainly got a lot of ideas for follow-up conversations. Fill out your evaluation forms before you leave and um, have a great weekend. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>